After this performance of the Babylonian creation epic, I will provide a short explanation of its historical context. Now please enjoy this production of The Enuma Elish When the skies above were not yet named, nor earth below pronounced by name, Apsu, the first one, their begetter, and maker Tiamat, who bore them all, had mixed their waters together. And no field was formed, no marsh was to be seen. When of the gods none had been called into being, then the gods were born within them. Lamu and Lahamu were called into being. As soon as they matured, they were fully formed. Then Anshar and Kishar were born, surpassing them. They passed the days at length, they added to the years. Anu, their firstborn son, rivaled his forefathers. Anshar made his son Anu like himself. And Anu begot Nadimud in his likeness, and he, Nadimud, also called Ie, was superior to his forefathers. Profound of understanding, he was wise. He was very strong at arms, mightier by far than Anshar, his father's begetter. He had no rival among the gods his peers. The gods of that generation would meet together and disturb Tiamat. Their clamor reverberated. They stirred up Tiamat's belly. They were annoying her by playing inside Anduruna. Apsu could not quell their noise, and Tiamat became mute before them. However grievous their behavior to her, however bad their ways, she would indulge them. Then Apsu, the begetter of the great gods, called out and addressed his vizier, Mamu. O Mamu, thou vizier, who rejoices my spirit, come unto Tiamat, let us go. So they went and sat in front of Tiamat, and discussed affairs concerning the gods their sons. Apsu made his voice heard, and spoke to Tiamat in a loud voice. Their ways have become very grievous to me. By day I cannot rest, by night I cannot sleep. I will abolish their ways and disperse them. Let peace prevail, so we can sleep. When Tiamat heard these words, she was furious, and shouted at her lover. She shouted dreadfully and was beside herself with rage, but then suppressed the evil in her belly. How could we allow what we ourselves created to perish? Even though their ways are so grievous, we should bear it patiently. Mamu gave Apsu counsel against the noisy gods and advised that Apsu destroy them in order to reinstate peace. Apsu agreed and made a plan to kill his sons. <coughs> Ie heard of these things, and together with his fellow gods, made a plan to overthrow Apsu and Mamu by placing a spell on them and then slaying them. He recited it, and it stilled the waters. He poured sleep upon him so that he was sleeping soundly, put Apsu to sleep, drenched with sleep. Vizier Mamu, the counselor, was in a sleepless daze. Ie unfastened his belt, took off his crown, took away his mantle of radiance and put it on himself. He held Apsu down and slew him. He set up his dwelling on top of Apsu. He tied up Mamu and laid him across him. When he had overcome and slain his enemies, Ie set up his triumphal cry over his foes. <coughs> then he rested very quietly inside his private quarters and named them Apsu and assigned chapels. He found his own residence there. And Ie and Demkina, his lover, dwelt in splendor. In the Chamber of Destinies, the Hall of Designs, Bel, Lord Marduk, the cleverest of the clever, sage of the gods, was begotten. And inside Apsu, Marduk was created. Inside pure Apsu, Marduk was born. Ie, his father, created him. Damkina, his mother, bore him. Marduk grew in awesomeness and became superior to all the gods. His limbs were ingeniously made, beyond comprehension, impossible to understand, too difficult to perceive. Four were his eyes, four were his ears. When his lips moved, fire blazed forth. The four ears were enormous, and likewise the eyes. They perceived everything. Highest among the gods, his form was outstanding. Anu created the four winds and gave them to Marduk. Marduk fashioned dust and used his winds to create a whirlwind. He also made great waves to disturb Tiamat. Tiamat was stirred up and heaved restlessly, day and night. 
The gods, unable to rest, had to suffer. Then Tiamat's children came and complained about their plight to her, and begged her to stop the endless noise. Angered by the death of her lover Apsu, Tiamat prepared for war against Marduk and the other gods. She bore great snakes, sharp of tooth and unsparing of fang. She filled their bodies with venom instead of blood. She cloaked ferocious dragons with fearsome rays, and made them bear mantles of radiance, made them godlike. She chanted, Whoever looks upon them shall collapse in utter terror. Their bodies shall rear up continually and never turn away. She stationed a horned serpent, a Mushusu dragon, and a Lamu hero, an Agalu demon, a rabid dog, and a scorpion man, aggressive Umu demons, a fish man, and a bull man, bearing merciless weapons, fearless in battle. Her orders were so powerful they could not be destroyed. In addition, she created eleven more likewise. Over the gods, her offsprings had convened a council for her. She promoted King Yu and made him greatest among them, conferred upon him leadership of the army, command of the assembly. Raising the weapon to signal engagement, mustering combat troops, overall command of the whole battle force, and she set him upon a throne, I have cast the spell for you, and made you the greatest in the gods' assembly. I have put you into your power rule over the gods. You shall be the greatest, for you are my only lover. Your commands shall always prevail over all the Nuki. Then she gave him the tablet of destinies, and made him clasp it to his breast. Your utterance shall never be altered, your word shall be law. When King Yu was promoted and had received the Anyu power, and had decreed destinies for the gods his sons, he said, What issues forth from your mouths shall quench fire, your accumulated venom shall paralyze the powerful. Once again Ea heard the evil plans made against the gods, and went to his father Anshar, and told him of Tiamat's scheme. Since Tiamat had exalted King Yu, the gods felt that no one could oppose her. And Shar sent Ea to plead with Tiamat, and to use a spell that would quench her rage. However, Ea was unsuccessful and turned back in fear of the mighty Tiamat and her monsters. The assembly of the gods sat in silence as Anshar asked for a new champion to rise up and challenge Tiamat. With Ea's encouragement, Marduk stepped forth. He promised Anshar that he would slay Tiamat, but that he had expected to be placed as king above all the gods when he returned. Anshar met with his vizier Kaka and ordered a celebration feast to be arranged. Kaka then went to Lamu and Lahamu and the rest of the gods to tell them of Tiamat's treachery, and that Marduk planned to defeat her in exchange for being exalted to king over all the gods. The Igigi, the Assembly of the Gods, wailed at the knowledge of Tiamat's plans. But they then rested in the assurance that Marduk would be victorious. They made ready for the feast. At the banquet they sat. They ate bread. They mixed sesame wine. The drink sweet, the mead, confused them. They were drunk with drinking. Their bodies were filled. They were wholly at ease. Their spirit was exalted. Then, for Marduk, their avenger, they decreed the fate. They founded a princely shrine for him. You are honored among the great gods. Your destiny is unequaled. Your word has the power of a new. From this day onwards, your command shall not be altered. Yours is the power to exalt and abase. May your utterance be law, your word never falsified. None of the gods shall transgress your limits. Wherever they have temples, be established for your place. O oh Marduk, you are a champion. We hereby give you sovereignty over all of the whole universe. Sit in the assembly, and your word shall be preeminent. May your weapons never miss. May they smash your enemies. O oh Lord, spare the life of him who trusts in you, but drain the life of the god who has espoused evil. Then the gods created a constellation, and told Marduk to destroy it and recreate it. He spoke, and it was so.
Marduk's mastery of destruction and creation sealed his new position, and the gods called out, Marduk is our king. Marduk gathered up his mighty weapons and set out to defeat Tiamat. He set the lightning in front of him. With a burning flame, he filled his body. He made a net to encircle Tiamat within it, marshaled the four winds so that no part of her could escape. The south wind and the north wind and the east wind and the west wind. The gift of his father anew, he kept them close to the net at his side. He created the Imhulu, the evil wind, the tempest, and the whirlwind, the four winds, the seven winds, the tornado, the unfaceable facing wind. He released the winds which he had created, seven of them. They advanced behind him to make turmoil inside Tiamat. The Lord raised the flood weapon, his great weapon, and mounted the frightful, unfaceable storm chariot. He had yoked it to a team of four and harnessed it to its side, slayer, pitiless, racer, and flyer. Their lips were drawn back, their teeth carried poison. They know not exhaustion, they can only devastate. Marduk marched on to Tiamat, who tried to cast a spell on him, but Marduk berated her for not showing compassion on her noisy children, and for appointing King Yu the power of Anu. He bellowed fiercely and exclaimed, Let your host prepare. Let them gird themselves with your weapons. Stand forth, and you and I shall do single combat. When Tiamat heard this, she went wild. She lost her temper. Tiamat screamed aloud with passion. Her lower part shook together from the depths. She recited the incantation and kept casting her spell. Meanwhile, the gods of battle were sharpening their weapons. Face to face they came, Tiamat and Marduk, sage of the gods. They engaged in combat. They closed for battle. The Lord spread his net and made it encircle her. To her face he dispatched the Imhulu wind, which had been behind. Tiamat opened her mouth to swallow it. And he forced in the Imhulu wind so she could not close her lips. Fierce winds distended her belly. Her insides were constipated, and she stretched her mouth wide. He shot an arrow which pierced her belly, split her down the middle, and slit her heart. Vanquished her, and extinguished her life. He threw down her corpse, and stood on top of her. When he had slain Tiamat, the leader, he broke her regiments, her assembly was scattered. Then the gods, her helpers, who had marched at her side, began to tremble, panicked, and turned tail. Marduk ensnared the demons who turned to run and keep them in captivity. He slew King Yu and took the tablets of destinies and sealed them with a seal and pressed them to his chest. He cried out in victory and stood upon Tiamat and crushed her skull. The north wind took her blood to the gods as good news. The gods rejoiced and came bringing many greetings and gifts. The Lord rested and inspected her corpse. He divided the monstrous shape and created marvels. He sliced her in half like a fish for drying. Half of her he put up to roof the sky. He drew a bolt across and made a guard hold it. Her waters he arranged so that they could not escape. He crossed the heavens and sought out a shrine. He leveled Apsu, dwelling of Nudimud. The Lord measured the dimensions of Apsu, and the large temple which he built in its image was Ashara. In the great shrine Ashara, which he had created as the sky, he founded cult centers for Anu, Elil, and Ie. He made stations for the great gods and divided the night sky into the twelve zodiac constellations. He gave the night to the moon god and the day to the sun god. Marduk created clouds and rain and fog. He took the other half of Tiamat and made the earth. The Tigris and Euphrates rivers ran from her eyes. The gods praised him for his victory in creation. 
Marduk proclaimed that a grand temple be built on the land he created between the heavens and the waters beneath, and that it was to be called Babylon. Together, Marduk and Ie discussed the creation of man, and King Yu was brought to them and sliced open. <laughs> From the blood of King Yu, man was created, and upon him was given the work of the gods, so that the gods may live in leisure. Marduk divided the 600 gods, who were called the Anunnaki, and appointed two groups to guard the sky and the earth. Then the gods asked what they could do as a favor to Marduk, and they said they wanted to build him a shrine. Marduk decreed that Babylon was to be built, and that it would be the center of religion, and decreed that it would be a resting place for the gods as they travel from below and from above. The mighty ziggurat Esagila was built in grandeur in the city of Babylon. In ascendancy, he settled himself in front of them, and his horns looked down at the base of Ashara. And when they had done the work on Esagila, the Anunnaki, all of them, had fashioned their individual shrines. The 300 Igigi of heaven and the Anunnaki of the Apsu all assembled. The Lord invited the gods, his fathers, to attend a banquet in the great sanctuary which he had created as his dwelling. The gods gave Marduk 50 names and titles, such as Gilima, who established the cosmic bond of the gods, who created stability, the ring that encompasses them, who prepares good things. And Adieu, let him cover all the sky, and may his fine noise rumble over the earth. May he shed water from the clouds and give sustenance to the people below. The gods continued their praise of Marduk, and made it so his power was absolute, and declared that his story be passed from generation to generation. May the peoples of Marduk, whom the Igigi gods created, weave the tale and call upon his name, in remembrance of the song of Marduk, who defeated Tiamat and took the kingship. I hope you enjoyed this rendition of the Enuma Elish, the Babylonian creation epic. The name Enuma Elish comes from the first two words in the opening line, translated as, when on high, when skies above, or when in the height heaven. It is also known as the Seven Tablets of Creation. It was recited on the fourth day of the New Year celebration in the capital city. The Babylonian New Year was celebrated from the first to the twelfth day of the month of Nisanu, which was around the spring equinox. Most of this performance was direct quotes from translations. However, I did provide a few paraphrases, mostly in place of repetitions, but also replacing a little bit of the less exciting exposition. Although the artifacts presented in this video are from the regions and time periods of the Enuma Elish, they were not meant to have definitive correspondence with the text. They do, however, give the viewer an idea of some of the material culture of the people who would have read these texts, and what sort of images would have come to their mind. There's a lot going on here, and even with careful study of the text, there can be confusion. This is for a few reasons. First, this tale was widespread and written down many times. However, the clay tablets on which they were written are often found fragmented, and therefore there's a bit of piecing together from different sources. Secondly, as the tale moved through the ancient Near East, and through time, the names were changed to reflect the religions of different times and places. More on this in a moment. Thirdly, the names of gods and titles are sometimes interchangeable, and can cause some confusion over which character is being discussed, as with the case of Nadimud and Ie. It was not uncommon in mythology around the world that stories were adopted by different cultures who would then change the names of some or all of the characters to more closely reflect their own religion. This appropriation and evolution is not unique to the ancient Near East. However, this can make stories quite confusing as broken tablets are pieced together and stories are compared from one city to another, each having their own most powerful god. Academic writers have their own preferences as to whether to emphasize the Babylonian or Assyrian influences on this tale. This production of the epic used Babylonian names from two different translations. However, those translations source material from Assyria as well. This ancient epic was found in both Assyrian and late Babylonian texts found in Ashur, Kish, 
Asher Banipal's library at Nineveh, Sultan Nepe, and other sites. Dating the story is very difficult with all things considered. Although one of the best preserved copies was written in Assyrian in the library of Asher Banipal, who reigned from around 668 to 626 BCE, it is generally thought that the Babylonian version came first, possibly as early as the 20th century BCE. As we heard, the Babylonian god Marduk rises to power and makes Babylon the center of civilization. In the Assyrian version, the god Ashur is the hero of the story and makes the city of Ashur, Assyria's capital, his seat of power. In another myth from Kutha in Iraq, the Sumerio Akkadian god Nurgal was the one who went to war with Tiamat's monsters and whose chief cult center ended up in Kutha. In the Babylonian text, one of Marduk's names given to him at the end is Adu, which is the name of an Amorite weather god. In an old Babylonian text from Mari, it is Adu, a West Semitic form of the weather god Adad, who is the conqueror over Tiamat. The Sumerian titles of Marduk and the notations from the scribes in the text, called colophones, indicate the tale probably went back even further to Sumerian times. There is an interesting and important similarity between the biblical book of Genesis and the Enuma Elish creation account. In both, orderly creation was derived from previously chaotic waters. In the Babylonian saga, Marduk uses wind to keep Tiamat's mouth open, giving his arrow access into her body. This scene is reminiscent of the second verse of Genesis, which describes the wind from God sweeping over the waters. Marduk splits Tiamat, the primeval salt waters, into two and used half of her body to make the sky and the other half the earth. When he pulled down the bar and posted guards, he bade them to not allow her waters to escape. In Genesis 1, on the second and third day of creation, God separates the primeval chaotic waters into two and creates a firmament between them. The firmament was the sky, and he fashioned the waters below into the earth and the seas. The waters that were left above the firmament were not further explained in the text, and they possibly became part of the heavenly realms. This divine separation of heaven and earth can be seen in the Sumerian texts as well, which are much older than the Babylonian ones. This concept of separating heaven and earth in primeval times is also in Egyptian mythology. Buried also in the text are other correlations to the Bible, such as the word deep in Genesis 1-2. The deep covered by darkness in this verse comes from the Hebrew word Tihon, and is linguistically related to the name of the goddess Tiamat. In the Bible, Tihon never occurs with a definite article, therefore it should probably be translated as a proper noun, deep, rather than the deep, wherever it occurs. In addition to this watery connection, there are multiple references to God destroying ancient sea monsters throughout the Hebrew Bible, which is also reminiscent of Marduk's defeat over Tiamat's monsters. However, I should note that in these references to sea monsters in the Bible, the name Tihom is not used. No matter what age this tale was crafted, it doubtless had far-reaching influence. Also, as we can see, this epic performed a very important function to societies at the time, when every year the story of the king of the gods was re-exclaimed in the capital of the earthly king. This would have sent a powerful message to the people and would have created a feeling of intense pride and allegiance, something important in the establishment of a stable civilization. Thank you very much for taking the time to watch this video. There are many more to come, so please don't forget to like and subscribe, and share with your friends who love mythology and history.